So I want to spend a little bit of time uh, going over some of the main points of the process simulation notes. Most of it you probably have had the opportunity to read through, so I don't want to read everything verbatim to you. I just want to hit some of the highlights and especially talk through some of the stuff related to uh, the R component of it. Uh, that way you just see it a few times, hear it a few times, and it will become a little bit easier uh, once we start getting into it. All right, so again, the main idea here, uh, just to just to repeat it one more time for you in case you, you haven't had a chance to read it yet. So the point of process simulation is that we are going to model any potential uncertainty within a process. If we have a process and we want to be able to make changes to it, the outcome of those changes aren't going to be uh, apparent to us immediately. And more often than not, they could actually cause us problems, right? They could have unintended consequences and negative consequences at that, that we really wouldn't want to just implement straight away. So what this process simulation is going to do is it allows us uh, to kind of sandbox any potential changes that we want to make. So the more uh, we know about the, the, out, the potential, all the potential outcomes of the process, the better idea uh, that we're going to have whether we should make those changes, if they're going to work, how they're going to work. And again, so this just gives us kind of a, a, a safety net for exploring those changes. So the next thing that this kind of gets into is all about queuing theory, which is the least fun sounding thing that you could ever imagine. Um, it is the mathematical study of lines. Good God, it just sounds boring to say the words. But um, it's really what underlies a lot of this work that we're going to have in process simulation. So if you know a little bit about this, this Kindle's notation stuff, that's great. It's not the most important stuff that we're going to get into. Um, again, nothing, nothing more, nothing too wild, nothing too crazy. All of this is just pretty simple stuff here. Again, stuff that we is presented for your background, but you don't need to know everything about this. Uh, here's a, a great example of Markov chains. So if we think about how lines actually form, they do follow a Markov process. Things come, things go, things come, things go. Sometimes more things come before things go, but that's essentially what a Markov process looks like. It's a, uh, in, in, this, in this world that we're getting in with this queuing theory, it's best, best described as a birth death process, which again, kind of sounds morbid, but uh, it's, it's what it is. So I want to give you some basic flows here before we start getting into this. Uh, the process flow, flow map, we're going to see that in a little while. We are going to obtain data. This is a little bit different because the data that we are going to have here is not really data that we've really seen before. These are just more broad descriptions about the process than anything else. They aren't necessarily, um, <clears throat> uh, you know, a, a tabular form of data that we're used to messing with. From there, we're going to create the model uh, based upon the data we have, validate, just make sure that it's right, right? Make sure that the, the process is how it's supposed to be. That's where we, now we get into the experimentation, right? What changes do we need to make? What changes are we thinking we're going to make? That's where we get into it. And then from there, we'll just analyze the results. All right, so nothing too wild. One thing that's bound by all of this stuff or that is a, a major component of the data that goes into these process simulations is the, our distributions. So the data really is um, talking more about the distribution. And we're going to see some different, some kind of common distributions as we go through our through our examples here. <clears throat> the first is the normal distribution, which you've all probably seen in your stats course before, right? It has two uh, parameters that we know that are gonna give it its shape and its location, right? So that's the, the mean and the standard deviation, mu and sigma there. So if we know the mean and the standard deviation of our normal distribution, we know exactly what it looks like, right? That, that's what helps define its, its shape. Again, things you've probably seen before. The exponential distribution is a little bit different. All we really know about it is its mean. The exponential distribution works really well when we're modeling things like wait times. So anything that is essentially going to be waiting, uh, we'll see modeled frequently by an exponential distribution. Uh, so waiting and arriving tend to be best used for that particular distribution. 
the Poisson distribution is something that we won't necessarily see very often for our particular problems, but it's a good distribution to know about because it's based on count variables. So anytime you would be modeling something that is a count-based process, uh, it's best going to be best to use a Poisson distribution. The lamest distribution, but we'll see it quite a bit. It's just the uniform distribution. Uh, so the uniform distribution, everything uh, pretty much has an equal probability of creeping up within the min and the max. So those are the only things that we really need to know about that, that uniform distribution is the min and the max. If we know the min and the max, then we know that everything between that min and max has an equal probability of happening. And so let's, uh, let's look at this next part here. We are going to create this process flow, flow map. So if we do this, couch this uh, in terms of visiting a bank, we would walk in the door, we would join a line, we would go see the teller, and then finally we would have served customers. Right? So that's, that's kind of what we have going on right there. There are some things that we want to know about with regard to performance. So some of the key things that we're looking at on performance are going to be service level. So the overall service level is kind of a big one. A mean cycle time at the buffer, that's how long something is uh, taking and being in line. And then we also just get an overall mean cycle time, right? So this overall mean cycle time here, that's how long things have taken to get all the way through the process from start to finish. So the, the minute they get in to the minute they leave, right? that's that overall mean cycle time. So let's look at an example here of a bank. So in this bank, we have an inner arrival time. That's kind of an important term, how often people arrive. Uh, that follows an exponential distribution. So again, anything where you have things arriving into a process, they're going to usually be bound by an exponential distribution. And here, on average, they're coming in every two minutes. So we have some information about this particular bank, and that is that a line in the bank will only hold eight people. So if someone comes to the bank and the line is already full, then that person will balk. They will walk away. They will go away. So it's just something to keep in mind. We have a limited capacity in our buffer, in our line. Right, so the next thing that we're going to get into, though, is the working time. So each teller, right now we just have one teller, and that teller has a working time. And that is best approximated by a normal distribution. Uh, on average, it's going to be 2.4 minutes with a standard deviation of 0.5 minutes. Right. So we're going to try to test two new ways to improve some of our metrics here. One is that we are going to see if we can add an automated teller, some kind of ATM machine that would ideally, uh, or in theory, reduce our service time per customer to an average of two minutes, right? So that's gonna shave some time off the teller's work time. And we could also try to add another teller. So let's uh, kind of get a feel for what that would look like. So that's one thing that we're gonna get into and one particular kind of model that will that we'll run. Another is gonna be an airport security line. We all love to fly. Um, it's, we all know it's in no way, shape or form a hassle at all, but this kind of gets into a new uh, part of, uh, of a model and that is on a decision point or a branch to the model. So in this particular regard here, we see that we have these two different inspection points. And from those two inspection points, we could either be done or we get broken out into a new line for additional screening. I don't know about you, but I always uh, am super thrilled when I get additional screening. It's my most favorite part of flying. So that's, those are two kinds of, um, of, of models that we could get into with our, uh, with, with, with uh, an inner arrival process. We could also model these things with regard to inventory. So anytime we're dealing with inventory, right, we are thinking about uh, how much stuff we have in storage. We don't ever want to keep more on hand than what we need, right? That just doesn't make any sense. Ideally, we want to have just the right amount. So how do we figure that out? Well, process simulation is going to do that. So we can look at a bread delivery kind of, um, of, a, of an exercise there. So what we're going to do now, though, is get into actually modeling one of these things in R. 
All right, so how do we make this work? So here is some code here for a process flow. Uh, again, pretty self-explanatory. It will take a little bit of time to kind of get a feel for including more stuff into it. But you can see that we've labeled these things. These are the labels that are gonna appear. And from there, we can just reference these with arrows, right? A to B, which is gonna be door to line, B to C, which is the line to the teller, C to D to tell her to serve the customer. So it really does become kind of a plug and play uh, endeavor. So what I want to do now is introduce you to the Simmer package. So Simmer is short for simulation, right? Simulation in R. So this is for discrete event simulation. And what we're gonna do here is we're going to kind of step through this because there, every one of these things, we're going to define a series of steps. So the first thing that we're going to do is we are going to define a trajectory. And if we just kind of think about what trajectory means, right, it's a path. So we are going to define a customer's path through the process. So that's where we say this customer, right, that customer is going to be an object and it is the trajectory and we're going to call that trajectory customer path. And so the next thing that we're gonna do is we are going to set an attribute. Before we do that though, I do wanna point out this little symbol to you right there. This is a pipe. That means take what you just did and then pass it into what comes next. So we're saying define a, traje a trajectory and then set some attributes for it. So a particular attribute that we're gonna set now is called start time. And what are we gonna do? We have to pass it a function. And the function that we're gonna to pass to it is another function called now, now bank. So now is a function that says, what time is it in the simulation? What is the current time? And what is the current time of the simulation is, well, what time is it in the bank? We haven't defined bank yet, we'll define it later. But just know that whatever we define here in bank for now, it has to be consistent with, with what we define as our environment later on. That'll make more sense when we get to it. <clears throat> so, right, so after that, we start thinking about this. So we've defined the tra tra trajectory. We have then uh, said what time is it now in the bank? And then we actually define what the person is going to do. So the first thing they're going to do is they're going to try to seize the teller, right? So they are going to seize. They're going to take that teller. They're going to take that teller's time. This is when they are actually having things done to them. All right, so this is kind of the important part of a process here. But this becomes a little bit different. We don't just seize the teller. Instead, we do something else, right? Because we're not going to seize the teller and seize it indefinitely. We're going to seize that teller for a certain amount of time. And that's where we use this timeout function. So we're going to say we're going to seize for a certain amount of time, and we're going to do it based upon a function. And here we're gonna use a function called rNorm, short for a random draw from a normal distribution. So this is where we put it, plug in some of the data that we'd previously talked about. We just want one draw from our normal distribution. If we think about every single customer, they all have their unique draws from that distribution. Finally, we'll produce a mean of 2.4 minutes, right? That's the mean working time. So that's the working time of the teller with a standard deviation of 0.5. So every single customer will have a draw from this distribution, right? that, from this normal distribution with these parameters that we've already uh, talked about. After they fulfill their timeout obligations, they release the teller. So this is what it looks like in its entirety. So, right, this, so this is the customer's trajectory as a whole. This is the whole entire thing. All right, so that's just the customer. That's just defining the trajectory. That's it. Now we also need to actually build the environment, right? A customer can't exist on their own. They have to have something to do. So that something to do is to exist within the bank. So we're going to create that thing called bank. Remember we talked about that earlier when we were talking about this now? Well, that's the bank. So we're gonna say simmer and we're gonna call this environment the bank, right? Bank here. 
So we can't just build a bank and not put anything in it. We need to add a resource. So when we add a resource, we're essentially adding a workstation here. That workstation, again, is the teller. So if we set the capacity equals to one, so that capacity one is going to say, we just have room to work on one thing at a time. Okay, so that's all that is doing with capacity. The queue size, though, is a little bit different. Queue size, remember we talked about that the line in front of that teller had room for eight people. So that's where we set the queue size there. The capacity is related to how many things it can work on on one time, and the queue size is how many people can line up in the front of it. All right, so just keep that, try to Try to remember that because uh, it's something that we're going to see quite a bit. Um, uh, so just, just kind of keep that in mind. The What comes after this, though, is actually getting customers into the bank. And this is where things, again, get a little bit on the, on the tricky side. So we're going to add a generator. And the generator is what's going to propagate customers through the bank. So we'll have, we're gonna, we're gonna call this customer. Well, what are we actually generating through there? We are going to generate trajectories through there. And those are going to be the customer trajectories, right? That customer trajectory that we already defined, that's where we're making this happen. So we're gonna, again, kind of generate this based upon a function. And we see a little bit of information here, mostly this. We see C, which is just going to create a vector of numbers, starting with zero. So that's at zero time in our bank. All of this is going to be based upon times in our bank. R exp, if we know that R norm is short for the random uh, draw from a random normal distribution, we may be able to guess that this is a draw from a random exponential distribution. Well, how many draws do we want to take out of this? When we were drawing those uh, random normal draws from the customer trajectory, we are doing one for every person. Here, we are going to have 100 of them. This is essentially generating 100 unique customers through the bank, that's right through our environment. So that's why we have this n equals 100. And now we have a rate. So this gets a little bit tricky because we know that a one of the key features of the, of the exponential distribution is a mean, which can also be expressed as a rate. So here, if we remember that we had a, uh, a mean of two minutes, we can define that as a rate, a rate of one person, right? One person every two minutes. So that's what we see expressed there in the rate, one person over two. Right, so one person every two minutes, and that defines our rate for that random exponential distribution. Finally, we have this negative one. So this negative one, what it does is it essentially shuts this down. If we would run out of people, run out of trajectories in this environment, if this environment sees this negative one trajectory come, then it knows that it doesn't have any more people to go through it, and it can stop itself. Finally, we're gonna specify our times. Now this gets a little bit on the tricky side. Again, we've been in the tricky side, uh, but we'll, we're gonna go ahead and keep talking about uh, the further tricky things to consider. Right now we have that until, well, we'll start with the bank. We're gonna run the bank, right? We're gonna run the environment. Until is the time component here. So this is how long we want to run our particular simulation. So until 120 here, we're going to say 120 minutes. So we're going to run this simulation for 120 minutes. And you may ask yourself, well, what it, what's, what's minutes? How do we know what to do there? We need to be consistent with what everything else is. So before we were talking about minutes, right? The average inner arrival time was in minutes. The average working time was in minutes. So here, if we want a time of two hours, we also need to convert that to minutes. If we're dealing in seconds, right? Everything has to be consistent. So no matter what unit we ultimately decide, we have to be consistent. We can't mix our units up. So if we have working times in minutes, we need to have our, our, sim, our total simulation time in minutes. If they're in hours, as expressed as, as fractional hours, then we have to have hours. So just always uh, remember that you have to keep your unit, your time units consistent from for, through all parts of your uh, simulation. If we put everything together, this is what we get. 
awesome, right? So really, that's not a whole lot of code to, to actually run this example. It's pretty straightforward. More importantly, though, we're going to get data. So this get mon arrivals that gets monitored arrivals. That's what we have here. So we have customers zero through five, right? That's, that's where we're using this head function. It's just showing us the first view. We see what the start time is. Remember that start time, we had a function of zero here, or zero in, in, that, in that vector. So we're the very first customer is gonna start at time zero. We see what their end time was and what their total activity time was. Right. So we see this for every single one of our uh, of our customers. Right. So here's where the kind of important part of this comes into play. That's just one simulation, just one. Uh, and I don't know about any of you, but I wouldn't feel comfortable making any claims off of one run of this. And that's where the process simulation part of this uh, kind of comes into play. And the simulation is kind of a key component. Anytime we're doing simulations, we don't just do one of anything. We do that many, 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 many times. So here we're going to, we're going, I'm going to show you two ways to get into replicating this uh, process simulation multiple times so that we get a better feel for uh, the potential uncertainty within our process. So the first is to use the replicate function. Here we're going to say replicate this 50 times and we're just going to run everything that we have ran before, right? Nothing, nothing tricky there. This, though, is one of those things that I wish that we could actually be together to get into because it's really cool, uh, but I'm going to give you some high, a high-level overview of what's happening here. We're going to use this package called Parallel. You don't need to install it. It's already installed in your, R, in your R installation. But what this Parallel package is going to allow you to do is it's going to allow you to run operations over all the cores or as many cores as you want on your machine. So that's where, where this make cluster detect cores comes into play. So if you have eight cores, for instance, on your machine, then it may uh, run your simulations on seven cores. So essentially you're going to run through your simulations seven times faster. So this is something to remember that anytime you get into a computationally intensive exercise like simulations would be, 50 is not going to be complicated. If we were running this 10,000 times, 100,000 times, parallelizing this would make it go much, much, much quicker. So you can kind of see what happens uh, there and how this is set up. Again, this is something we don't uh, really need to spend a lot of time worrying too much about, but it's a, uh, something that will be helpful for the future. Right. So one thing I do want to show you a little bit more of is how to add a second teller. Remember, that was one of the things that we may want to try a little bit. Uh, it's pretty tricky. All we need to do is change that capacity to two in our resources there. That's all we have to do. And that gives us our second teller. So uh, we could get into, we'll, uh, eventually we'll get into some branching stuff. Or that'll be good stuff to see, right? We can talk about some manufacturing, right? This is all, all great stuff. Working with sim simmer data is going to be kind of an important thing to see uh, what all is going on in there. Yeah, most of this is pretty easy to just kind of read through. And I would anticipate that as you've read through this and had some time to digest it, you'll probably be able to formulate some questions out of this. So until we have the, the, a chance to meet together, uh, I do urge you to kind of go through the notes, make sure that you can install Simmer, uh, the Simmer package, make sure that all is going well and according to plan there, and start playing around with some of this code. Make sure you can run, run it, make sure it makes some sense, uh, and then start bringing questions to, the, to our kind of uh, digital office hours. And then that way we can start to get into some of this stuff, answer some of those out, outstanding questions that you may have, and that will make things go a little bit easier for us. Until next time, I'll see you later.